My name is Han. This is my family. My wife, my two sons, my little girl. My story is the story of thousands of Chinese farmers like me. It begins many years ago when war and terror first came to my land. When the skies of China rained bombs instead of water. Bombs that fell on city and town and field alike. On soldier and farmer and tradesman. We became a nation of refugees, not citizens. The end of the war was not an end of suffering for us. We were still hungry. We had no clothes, and our house was far away. But home we must go. If trains and trucks could not take us, our feet could. Mile after weary mile, day after day, and the days turn into weeks, and the weeks into months. In sunshine, in rain, in cold, in heat, nothing stopped us. We were going home to the village where we had lived and worked once long ago. The desire was strong in us, and whatever the cost in sweat and pain, it must be done. We were going home. We ate when we could, and where we could, and what we could. My wife always prays before meals, saying it gives her strength. It is foolishness, but it does no harm, so I let her do this. But I will put my face in the muscles of my own arms, and trust to fate. And so we journeyed along many roads and through many valleys till we came one day to the village that is our own, to the orchard that belongs to me, Han. My beautiful orchard at last, my beautiful peach orchard. Where are my trees and my land? My fine rich earth has become a patch of sand and weeds. From earth like this, green things will never grow. How shall we live, I ask myself. How shall we live? But at least we shall have our little house again. The village church still stands and my wife is joyful. I cannot share her happiness in these childish things. I think only of my fields, my ruined land. Our village seems half deserted. There are some faces which are strange to us and many faces missing. Old friends and neighbors who will return no more. 
And here, here is our house where once we lived so happily. is sick within me and I think the weary miles will come for this but my wife is strangely brave I will cook some cornmeal for supper she says calmly Like my wife, the children set about their chores quietly, cheerfully, without bitterness or complaint. Before we eat, they offer thanks to their Christian God for his many blessings. Blessings, I think. Have they taken leave of their wits? Thanks. Thanks for what? Stop the stupidity, I shout. And then I notice that the village pastor is standing in the doorway. I don't care. I do not wish the friendship of a man who can preach gratitude for such hardship. I won't be one of his flock, his flock of fools. On our way to work the next morning, my son and I meet an old neighbor. It is good to see his face. It's like old times, he says, but I think bitterly to myself, old times are gone, never to return. On our way through the village, we stop at the tea house. Tea house? Times are so bad there is not even tea, and we drink plain hot water. Old times, always the talk of old times. They congratulate me on having a fine strong son to help me in the fields. What fields? Ten such sons could not bring back the rich brown earth to my land. They hope to see me in church on Sunday. I say nothing, but in this they are old fools. I would not be there. I have no interest in him seeing. I have work to do. But where to begin? The task is impossible. My neighbor Chang comes to talk to us. And he tells us that he too returned to find that his orchard had been chopped down for firewood and his earth washed away. But the teacher of farming at the mission showed him how he might reclaim his land. I wish no help from missions. But Chang argues with me. And at last, out of curiosity, I agree to see this man. I listen to this teacher with growing wonder. The man is no fool, but a person of learning and much experience. 
And yet he is a fool. Why does he live here in poverty with us, giving up gold that he could earn elsewhere? Why does this mission offer to give me baskets of topsoil to carry back to my land? I do not understand. For what do they do this? Why? Meanwhile, my wife and the children set to work, cleaning up the house and courtyard. During the morning, the pastor drops by to talk with my wife. He offers to give schooling to my daughter, Mei Mei. When my wife tells me of this, I refuse at first. Education for a girl? But when I see how happy it will make my daughter, I say yes, it may be done. And so the next morning when my son and I go again to the fields, Mei Mei goes for the first time to a school. Son and I know that our task is great, even hopeless, but we must work. There is nothing else to do. We bring the earth given us by the mission and sow it like seed upon our bearing fields. The baskets are heavy and the day is hot and the work is hard. For many weeks we work like beasts of burden. Meanwhile, my daughter attends the mission school, and she works hard, too, at her lessons. And my wife and little boy work at repairing our home. At noon times, I return to the house for refreshment and a moment's rest. Often I feel discouraged, and I resign myself to my despair. But always my wife has faith that all will be well. Without her courage, I would not have the heart to go on. On this day, my daughter brings me a page of her schoolwork. Suddenly, I am proud that I, Han, who can neither read nor write, should have such a daughter, gives me great joy. I continue to talk with the strange teacher of farming, and from him I learn many things. He knows a great deal. But the family of Han has a scholar too. One day I show him my daughter's work because I am proud. But stupid one that I am, I hand him the writing upside down. On Sundays, my family makes a great fuss about going to church.
not understand what my family finds in this church of theirs. I went with them once. It was strange to me. They sit, they listen, there is quiet, there is music, and they sing. Nothing has happened. No work has been done. And yet they return with gentleness in their hearts, happy and refreshed. But my religion is work. There is so much to be done. I listen to the church bells as I toil endlessly over my fields. Work can be bitter when one is alone and my heart seems strangely empty. And then that same Sunday afternoon, in our little courtyard, tragedy befell us. It came without warning. the news, my despair knew no bounds. After all our hardships, thus. An unexploded cartridge in a rubbish pile, left by I know not what soldier during the war. And my son is injured. Why? Why? I feel helpless and desperate until the pastor tells me that he has already arranged to take my son to the mission hospital where he will receive the care of learned doctors. If I had believed in my wife's God, I would have prayed to him then. Almost I envy the face of my wife and children. It was then I envied those who had faith to be able to say, let it not be too late. Let him recover. He is my son whom I love to be able to pray. But I have not this faith. I have nothing. I am alone. The doctor takes me to see the place where my son will be cared for. I see the clean white beds and the faces of children who were once sick but who now grow well. And then he tells me that my son's injury is not fatal. I restrain the joy that floods me. Two days later, when I leave the hospital, I feel suddenly grateful for the help of the mission. I am moved by this kindness, but I do not understand it. I go back to my fields to distract my thoughts with work, but something strange happens here. My field is full of men who are at work. Who are these men? What right? And then I see that they are neighbors. But why do they do this? I watch these friends at work as though I watch a dream. It cannot be true. 
It is like a miracle, and I do not believe it. Even my friend Chang is here. He too works hard. And the women work along with the men. I cannot stand this wonderment longer. I will ask someone. We are friends, my neighbor says, and Christian friends must help each other. I ask my teacher for an explanation. Why do you do this for me, I ask. I have no money to pay these people. We want no money, he answers. No money? Why then do they do this? What has happened? Have they lost their reason working for me and without pay? And then at last the pastor explains. When he told the story of my plight to his congregation, they responded by putting the principles of Christ into action. For faith is expressed in deeds as well as words. Christ's hands were hands of healing, hands of toil, hands which gave the broken loaves to hungry ones and comforted little children, hands which pointed to the signs of God in field and sky and human folk, hands nailed by evil to a cross of sacrifice, hands of blessing which show forth his spirit and his love. Our hands are his today to do his deeds. This is something which his hands are doing here this very day. That afternoon I am restless and I walk the fields thinking and wondering. The pastor's words still ring in my ears like a melody that cannot be forgotten. I see now that no man need be alone, even in his suffering. For all men can be together in God, united by faith in one who died for us. At last I begin to understand why this church is here, its door open to the world of man and to me.